And uh, Paul, Professor Paul Goodwin will start the event. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Train Open Live event. I've got a fantastic event this evening. Um, Dr. Anna Sadojevic, um, who will be talking about anti-colonial representation at the Museum of African Art in Belgrade. And judging from the the masterclass that we had with her this morning, um, it will be a fantastic lecture. So we're very much looking forward to that. Let me just quickly introduce you to Train. So Train is the Research Centre for Transnational Arts, Identity and Nation, based at UAL. And we are a community of researchers across UAL. We are the only UAL based research centre with members in all colleges of the university. And the train's research really is driven by a desire to critique dominant ideas of globalisation and to open up new perspectives that address questions of how art and design can respond to issues around social justice, to the decolonization of institutions, and also to the creation of more diverse global art histories. Um, our members include internationally recognised scholars and practitioners across UAL, and we have a very vibrant community of postgraduate students. Um, and of course, we have uh, research um, associates, of which Dr. Nelia Milic is one. Um, so I'd like to, what I'm going to do is just quickly, briefly introduce um, Dr. Milic, um, who is working with TRAIN um, to develop uh, a very a fantastic project called Post Socialism and Art, which is a new initiative that she'll talk about very briefly. But Dr. Milic is an artist and an academic working in media and arts and is also a senior lecturer and year two, year two contextual and theoretical coordinate, studies coordinator in the design school at the London College of um, Communication. Um, so I'll hand over now to Dr. Milic to introduce um, our event tonight and really looking forward and, and a, a huge warm train welcome to Dr. Um, Sladovic. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the kind introduction as always. Um, uh, welcome everybody and thank you to uh, some of you who uh, have been with us this morning. We clearly can't get enough of Anna uh, and uh, no wonder because this morning has been a wonderful event uh, and it is a true representation of what uh, both Evelina and I imagined that post-socialism and art project is going to be like. So Anna uh, Sladovic is an independent curator who is our guest tonight. She's also art and media theorist uh, who studied uh, museums as complex objects, whose previous discourses often inscribed within different unrecognized or invisible elements, such as surplus of museum production in form of archives, documentation or study materials, bear influence on how a meaning is formed. She researched these questions, particularly within the context of the Museum of African Art, the Veda and Dr. Zdravko Pechar collection, and the Museum of Yugoslavia, with emphasis on certain aspects of these institutions that are related to historical non-alignment. She took part in the following projects, Southern Constellations, the Poetics of the Non-Aligned, at a Museum of Contemporary Art Metelkova in Ljubljana, Asia Culture Center in Guangzhou, uh, then the project Tito in Africa, picturing solidarity at Museum of Yugoslavia, Pitt Rivers Museum and Wende Museum in Los Angeles, and One Man No Chop, a reconceptualization of the Museum of African Art, the Veda and Dr. Zdravko Petcher collection project at MAA in Belgrade, as well as the project Non-Aligned Modernism in Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade, funded by Erste Stiftung. So, uh, Anna, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Nella, very much. Let me see if you are seeing the presentation now. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for the invitation to talk within the Train Open Live event. Uh, I'm delighted, of course, to be with you today. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone uh, who find time to join us. 
I would also use the opportunity to thank the Museum of African Art uh, in Belgrade for hosting my presentation. Uh, part of my methodology that I developed during uh, the last decade, let's say, was always to bring the topic of my um, deliberation into a picture and uh, to position myself within the narrative uh, that I address. Before I start this presentation, I would like to give you an outline of what I will be talking about. Um, I will be combining uh, theoretical and practical approaches, as I also uh, rely on a lot of my personal experience with this particular museum and some concrete, uh, let's say, problems or obstacles that I encountered. So perhaps for those who are more interested in theorization of a museum, the presentation may seem to peppered uh, with actual examples from the museum work and curatorial practice, but as the practice influenced the theory just as much as theory influenced the practice, I felt it was necessary to uh, bring in some details in order to have a clearer picture, not only of this museum, but of museum normalization, inclusion and exclusion of certain topics. Uh, and visibility and invisibility of certain values and ideas. You may also notice that I uh, reveal um, certain aspects of the museum as the presentation progresses, but this is in tune with how these uh, aspects reveal to me over 20 years. So every curatorial proposition that uh, we made uh, with how these, uh, I mean, was in tune with how these aspects reveal to me. Um, and by we, I mean my colleague Emilia Epstein and I, um, uh, as two of us made a team that carried out the concept of uh, what I would call a long-term methodology that was theoretically based in my PhD that I defended in 2012, uh, which I will also present here partially. And I will end the presentation with a completely new proposition. Uh, from the current position, written especially for this presentation, that actually builds upon all the previous methodologies applied so far. Now, for over a decade uh, now, I have been engaged in research and uh, understanding what a decolonization of a museum, once it is translated from theory to practice and vice versa, would actually mean. Every attempt at decolonizing uh, the museum discourse uh, basically has to be about decolonizing ourselves, no matter what social identities or positions we identify with. In addition, I would say that every institution is eligible for decolonial criticism, as the all-pervasive influence and legacy of colonialism has been deeply ingrained in the functioning of our global society. Uh, it is not possible, of course, to divorce it from the more general scope of demographics, economy, politics, education, academia, media and representation. I was interested in how these conclusions can be communicated through an already existing institutional framework, such as this one, where I find myself today, that could serve its purpose while employed in a somewhat different and more contemporary and engaged manner. So let's see if the slideshow is working. You can see the first slide. Okay, the main premise in my work was that any attempt at uh, systematically decolonizing a museum should start as a research with an honest interest in and appreciation for all the previous layers of a palimpsest that any museum inevitably is. This particular museum, the Museum of African Art, the Veda and Dr. Zdravko Petar collection in Belgrade, provided the base for my theoretical research that I in return incorporated back in its own work over the course of years in collaboration with Emilia and with participation of other colleagues from the museum as well as independent curators, researchers, theorists, artists, going back and forth between theory and practice and finding ways to reflect one in another proved to be a crucial part of this methodology. Now, largely surpassing the museum collections as 
sums of individual objects that were often understood as uh, the main museum's raison d'etre. The focus of my work was rather on strategies of collecting context of museums establishing prevalent and changing museums' narratives, secondary collections, objects and archival records that, that sometimes up to that point were not even considered a collection and sometimes nothing more than a surplus of museums' production. Through this research, a very characteristic imprint of an institution emerged, one that allowed for a more just assessment of its institutional efforts at decolonizing museums' narratives from its very beginning. Museum of African Art, the Veda and Dr. Zdravko Petr collection, is not an ordinary museum, as I said, when it comes to deliberations on decolonization, as it has been established and proclaimed as the only European anti-colonial museum exhibiting African art. The discourse from the time of its uh, opening and the way its positioning changed within the local community, along with changes in social and political context, additionally complicates the issue of thinking about decolonization. Therefore, my interest in this museum was not only about how can the museum be decolonized, as is the main question when the most of the Western museums um, are in question and uh, the question that they are posing at this very moment, but also what does it mean to have an anti-colonial museum? Is there something that can be called distinctly anti-colonial about it? And if there is, what is it? Does having an anti-colonial museum even discursively already presents itself as a sort of emancipatory affective heritage? Even though it may seem um, completely expected um, that uh, the Museum of African Art was opened in then socialist uh, Yugoslavia, uh, due to the politics of the non-alignment where Yugoslavia had a prominent role as the first conference of what will become the non-aligned movement was held in Belgrade in 1961, we need to give it a bit more of context. Let me just a second to see yes everything's fine uh, the very opening of the museum in 1977 was a product of different circumstances of different people investing their particular worldviews activities uh, and tastes into creating such an institution first of all Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr who were the collectors of the core collection and then initiators of the very idea of the museum influenced the very notion of what this museum will be. What was implicit on the day of its opening was the anti-colonial spirit that marked lives of both of them. No one had to explain the links of anti-colonialism and non-alignment to the audience who listened to the opening speech by the city mayor Živorad Kovacevic and to Maria Crnoburi actress who read a letter that Veda and Zdravko, who were packing their things back in the Kra, sent. Namely, Zdravko Petr was finishing his term as the ambassador of the socialist Yugoslavia in Ghana, and values of anti-colonialism and non-alignment were the realities they lived with. As communists, they were obviously aware of the danger of perceiving collecting as bourgeois activity, so they commented on it in terms of their will to share their effort and the passion with the society in large. It reads explicitly, actually, from their letter that I hope you can see, an excerpt from which um, I put on screen. Now, I will not be reading the letter, but I will just uh, turn your attention to this part where they say, uh, to become part of the currents of social organism. I mean, you can actually see that the language, the very language uh, is rather different. So this, this is kind of discourse that was present at the time of museums opening. Their act of collecting, however, not only produced a collection uh, that was shaped according to certain prevailing criteria of the time, therefore, 
introducing a meta discourse of Western collecting in its own right. But the very museum became, from the beginning, identified with the collection, hence the name Museum of African Art, the Veda and Dr. Zravko Petr collection. This is where I pinpoint the first obstacle in creating an anti-colonial museum, the collection itself. And on top of this, the Western type collecting that did everything to divorce the value of what was construed as quote unquote African art within the Western market, galleries and museums from the agency of its creation. And it did this by establishing control over knowledge by producing and reproducing expertise as commodity. This aspect of collecting, however, was not grasped by the initiators of the museum. They felt that bringing the collection within the existing canon of African art and collecting would legitimize it, while at the same time they kept insisting on the difference between this collection and museum in regard to Western type collections that were, as it was mentioned numerous times in texts and press releases, formed from the quote unquote colonial plunder. However, apart from this insistence on difference, the Museum of African Arts link with the ideology of non-alignment was never immediately readable within the representational framework of the permanent display. During the specific social and historical circumstances of the 1990s, <clears throat> sorry, and the war and wars across ex-Yugoslav ter territories, the museum became, if not completely invisible, then definitely culturally marginalized. There were few visitors and budgeting covered the very basic means necessary to keep the institution running. The context in which the Museum of African Art has been created, as well as the nominal supporting narratives of non-alignment and anti-colonialism, no longer held a prominent role in its public presentation. Once the non-alignment and anti-colonialism were erased from the public discourse, what became domineering over the whole of museum representation in the lack of all other discourse was the permanent display. Done according to ethnographic labels and ethnically led distribution of objects throughout the museum space. This concept was written down by the first museum director, Jelena Rangelovic Lazic. Jelena was working at the Ethnographic Museum in Belgrade prior to her move to the Museum of African Art, where she will be the first director, but also the museum's first curator and researcher. She was the one who gave the first descriptions of objects and has done the research on their origin. It is due to her that the identification files on objects for ethnographic, adapted from the practice of the Ethnographic Museum, the first exhibition of the collection took place in Ethnographic Museum a couple of years before the museum's opening. This ethnographic aspect that leaked into the museum practice through the very nature of collecting channel by its initiators, by the Zagorac and Zdravko Petr, but more importantly, by Jelena Rangelovic Lazic and her background, was finally cemented by its permanent display with ethnographic labels, a display that was never meant to last for 44 years, which is how old it is now. There was a number of other contributors um, to the overall museum visual and semantic register, but the reason as to why collectors and ethnographic aspects became so dominant, in my mind, is the invisibility and erasure of other presupposed meaning that with the loss of discourse from the time of its opening, lost their role and could not be recognized as such anymore. At 2000, it is already an institution that looks completely detached, both from what has been before or what came afterwards. It betrays this feeling of being completely isolated and is actually often referred to as an island or oasis by the rare press accounts or the visitors exoticizing the museum in more ways than one. Well, there was this kind of distancing from the whole history of non-alignment 
Nevertheless, the anti-colonial prefix state, as it was still understood as an added value, since the museum built its significance during its whole institutional life on the discursive difference in comparison with the museums in the West. I think that the presence of this trope is important to underline because it remained clearly ingrained in remembrance and memory regionally that the Museum of African Art Collection evolved in a completely different manner than the museums in the West and that it grew out of friendship, a sincere respect, mutuality and collaboration, in particular within the non-aligned context. At the beginning of 2000s, its permanent display was still more or less the same from the time of its opening in 1977, giving it, as I said, uncanny or alternative modernist and isolated look that provoked the chief curator from the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in Belgrade at the time, Dejan Sredenovic, to set up an exhibition in 2004 under the name of Black Body White Masks, uh, paraphrasing Fanon's seminal work. He used the display of this museum to show its ambivalence in a historically, factually and theoretically wide approach. He interpolated images from consumerist culture, travelogues, anti-colonial discourse that we speak about, such as books written by Zdravko Petr. He basically went back and forth between the output of earlier writers, such as Dr. Costa Dinic uh, in service of the Belgian king Leopold II in the 19th century, then Rasko Petrovic, modernist artist on his way through the countries of West Africa in 1928. And then he would go back to photographs from the Museum of Yugoslavia and Tito with statesmen in Africa from 1960s, 70s and 80s. And altogether, it was a very complex and um, uh, complex image, I think, that engaged the permanent display in ways that were not considered before. And for me personally, this exhibition was important as I, uh, as I was employed as in-house curator at the time at this museum. It, in a way, it gave me the vocabulary uh, to reflect upon things that have already been on my mind, but I had no way to articulate them. It was actually my confusion about this museum being nominally anti-colonial, with us curators expected to repeat the same lines from the catalogues written based on the output of Western type museums that were at the same time criticized as colonial and built out of pillage. Another thing that uh, I reflected on was the lack of anti-colonial discourse uh, within its visual register. There was nothing within the museum that was immediately readable as anti-colonial in relation to Yugoslav times, apart from the names of the museum initial collection founders, Veda Zagorac and Mizravko Petr, who were largely forgotten, and the yeah, humongous, humongous ship anchor at the museum's entrance that was accompanied by a plate stating that Yugoslav peoples never took part in the slave trade. This is, of course, problematic in many ways, but in displaying the object that made part of the inhumane subjugation and death industry that was slave trade, and basically to use the tragedy of millions in order to show that we had nothing to do with it. But it was not unusual for the exceptionalist attitude of Yugoslav discourse on topics of colonialism at the time. I actually found myself often smirking at the comparison of Yugoslavs and uh, quote unquote Habsburgs and Ottomans with African peoples under the colonial rule, which was a comparison used numerous times by Josip Broz Tito, Živorod Kovacevic, the city mayor of Belgrade, even Leopold Sedar Senghor on his visit to Yugoslavia in 1975. But in relation to this uh, normalized figure of speech, I now found, find that the theoretical concept of imperial difference in decolonial theory would actually be an important aspect to include in further research, not from the position of exceptionalism, of course, but rather in understanding the complexities of overlapping cultural influences and also in creation and perpetuation of both self-image and the relations of power and imagined hierarchies. 
anti-colonial and non-aligned discourse of the time of museum's founding were in fact so obscured and virtually effaced by the 2000s that the artist Barthélemy Togo, when he came as a resident artist for several days uh, in the summer of 2006, within the program of somewhat unfortunate or perhaps deliberately provocative title, Colored World, proposed by artist and in this case curator Mikhail Milonovic, made a very suggestive comment about it in form of an, of an artwork. He brought along an exhibition called Transits and he was asked if he would make an in situ installation within the huge space on the first floor of the museum called the Dome. This space, uh, a result of another ambitious project by Zdravko Petr, came out of his uh, insistence to have a conference space within the museum to offer to host another meeting of the non-aligned movement that took place uh, once more in Belgrade in 1989. The dome was erected over the already existing building, but it was never finished to this day. In this majestic, half-finished space that eerily reminds one of the interior of a wooden ship, Bartelemy Togo created an artwork he named Homage to Zdravko Petr. The mention of only Zdravko Petr in his dedication is also indicative of the effacement of Veda Zagorads as an equally important voice and force in museum's creation, or even more important, which is something that Emilia Epstein writes about in her recent text. Uh, under the title of Tracing Veda Zagorats at the Museum of African Art. And it has to do with certain normalization and perpetuation of hierarchies of memory and forgetting, where Veda Zagorats, even though an extraordinary woman, was gradually pushed into oblivion, that is, until some effort was invested in recuperating the memory of her, which is something I will come back to. Now, but telling me Togo was offered to use in his creative process everything that was in the museum, in the museum shop, in museum storages, in the museum building, everything that he could see, who he could use. So uh, this uh, unusual incentive came from then director Natisa Knezhevich Sheehan. And uh, this is the artwork that came out of it. This is a dedication. Let me just go back a second. He conquered the space by building the transportation line, like in the airports, using the museum posts to hold the accumulation of very different objects, which obviously links museums to colonial pillage of culture and natural wealth. The skulls, in case that you're wondering, were trophies that Zdravko Petr took back as he was an avid hunter too. Bartholomew made an intervention in this book that I showed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was Africa remix, remix catalog, but I cannot be certain because months after his stay in Belgrade, this book unfortunately disappeared. I took a photo, fortunately, because, before we lost the trace of, of this dedication with the name of the work. I don't know if you can see it, but it says my, art, my work is dedicated to Mr. Petcher. And I would say it was in a way eye-opening uh, as to how the museum is seen by someone who is relying on his artistic perception and intuition and reads the visual register informed by their own background. It was blatantly obvious that there was nothing left of the anti-colonial or non-aligned discourse with the museum presentation and Togo's work I mean, his artwork was a bitter, bitter reminder of that. We who grew up in the socialist Yugoslavia could feel this anti-colonial solidarity and the, that it cannot be brought down just to stereotypical images of taking from Africa, exporting from Africa, whether it is art, culture or the living world. The same difference in standpoint towards this museum, which can be defined perhaps as the difference in affective heritage, was obvious in 2014 uh, when we organized one among many conversations within the context and representations program uh, in the museum space. This time it was in the museum garden. 
and curator Anders Kreger, who came with the intention of writing a paper for the After All journal, which he did, was my collocator with participation of the audience, a number of curators among them. The difference in perception between people who did not have the same affective heritage and who repeatedly perceived the, this museum just as any other ethnographic museum exhibiting African art made us think about what has not been done when it was supposed to, how to make this anti-colonial legacy relevant again, but also what kind of decolonization and de-stereotypization of the visual register are we to do. I feel I owe a culturally specific additional explanation here, um, as this kind of affective heritage belongs to a more general sense of Yugoslav identities that, as I said, went through thorough and aggressive erasure during 1990s that continued into 2000s, a deep rupture in what I perceive as historical, as autobiographical narrative in heritage is something worth thinking about when it comes to museum representations of the so-called post-Yugoslav region. In my case, I would say that my personal link to emancipatory heritage of the socialist Yugoslavia is not about holding on to old structures or identities, and not even the simple reactivation of those same principles as they all need to be understood in regard to our current situation. As much as it is a revolt against an aggressive redefinition on the state level, supported by its agents of representation as to what my identities are or should be, that I feel gravely impoverished the repertoire of, of what I as a human being can choose from to represent me that is in case that I choose any of it to represent me. Now, um, anyway, let me, let me show you an analysis of what I distinguished in my PhD, uh, defended in 2012 as colonial visual apparatus appropriated to models of collecting and what I, what I distinguished as anti-colonial rhetoric. So I will not be reading all of this. You can, you can read it on your own. Um, but I would just say that uh, I did distinguish some things that, that were indicative and perhaps indicating some new modes of representation within this museum. Uh, in case that, that you want, I, I, I can come back to this, but I will just continue now and we can perhaps um, discuss this a bit later. Now, besides these elements that I labeled as anti-colonial, there were other traces, such as the sculpture of Africa made by artist Nikola Kolya Milunovic, that as part of interior greeted the visitors at the very entrance, uh, and it represented the political and not geographical aspects of the continent. Instead of representing Africa through its geographies, chose to represent it through civic political engagement that resulted in decolonization of a large number of African countries, this way creating a strangely unrecognizable terrain of the African continent, as at the first sight we cannot recognize what is different with this picture, as it seems as if mountains are rising where we know that plains are, and vice versa. And, uh, and the building, as it was in 1977, um, as in the meantime, it underwent serious changes in appearance, both exterior and interior-wise, was a work of architect Sloboda Nilic, who admitted that African architecture was not his forte, so comparisons with African architecture are not in place. However, what he wanted was to make an unimposing building, unlike temple-like structures of Western museums, but rather one that would express different ideas and ideals and have a significant impact on the representation itself. He imagined a building with grass roof incorporated into scenery with lanterns that allowed for natural light to come through. It is also important to mention that this museum was uh, one of three museums in the 1960s and 1970s in Belgrade to have a building purposely built to host a particular collection. The other two museums were Museum of um, 25th of May, opened in 1962, that later made part, part of the Memorial Center Josip Rostito, 
now the Museum of Yugoslavia, and the second was um, uh, the building of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade, built in 1965. Now, my colleague Emilia Epstein and I continued with these discussions on anti-colonial representation within the already mentioned program contexts and representations that ran from 2014 to 2018. We opened a talk on different topics within the museum, but in particular on the meaning of the initial discourse from the time of its opening, namely the anti-colonialism and uh, non-alignment for its constituencies. And based on this work, we proposed um, our concept for the 40th anniversary of the museum that resulted in an exhibition and a publication in 2017. Uh, and we did it in collaboration with the uh, assistant curator Anna Knezevic, assistant in digitization, Milica Naumov, designer Ivana Bunushevac, historian Nemanja Radonic, and a large number of contributors to, to the publication, among them theorist Olivier Dushi, curator Dan Sretenovic, theorists Jelena Vesic and Vladimir Jeric Vlidi, and all of the curators and directors from the very Museum of African Art. This methodology was meant to emphasize the need for linking different approaches and discourses, and every person was actually asked to contribute with what they knew the best, whether it was documentation, collections, conservation, history, or theory. I have to say that I'm still rather proud of this accomplishment, as it gave, in my mind, a rather complete, and I dare say, fruitful image of what this institution was. Um, at that point. The name of the exhibition is rather long and it served to express our linking to the ideas of uh, community, rethinking the museum itself and proposing a methodology for its reconceptualization. The whole name was Nimpakor Nzidzi, One Man No Chop, Reconceptualization of the Museum of African Art, the Veda and Dr. Zravko Petr collection. Now, Nimpakor Nadzizi is uh, an inscription on the side of the boat that we learned Zravko Petr received from Mr. Okran, um, um, who is a, a successful businessman, who was a successful businessman and uh, uh, the chief of the village Mankoadze in Ghana. And um, Kwesi Miles, who was director of the National Museum in Ghana at the time, uh, told, told us the, the, the uh, told us told, told uh, 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 the curators at the time that the interpretation of this saying was one man no chop. So we decided to use this English translation as well. Now, apart from being the exhibit number two at the Museum of African Art, um, the boat inscription was a sort of a catchphrase of the museum, pointing out um, at the importance of communality, as in a wider sense it referred to the politics of uh, non-alignment. Now, um, we were aware that we need to take everything into account to make an exhibition about everything that was otherwise invisible or normalized, starting from the building to those forgotten or invisible bearers of the anti-colonial discourse, both within the museum space and in the documentation that was left behind Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr. Uh, written documents, photographs, films, sound recordings, library, of course, at the time of the museum's founding, the importance of this uh, collection was not the same as it is today, as it was not considered a collection in the first place. Nevertheless, Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr, followed by Elena Rangelovic Lazic, showed an awareness that museum's documentation, including their personal documentation of Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr, will over the course of years gain in importance a notion that is coming into fruition at the present moment. In the past several years, namely, there is a growing number of theorists working in different spheres who are requesting insight into the museum's documentation of Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr. The work of these researchers is valuable because in comparison to the bulk of the museum's prolific publishing that features thematic exhibitions and accompanying texts almost exclusively engaged in ethnological approaches to quote-unquote African art, their approaches theorized topics that were until recently completely overlooked, as is the case with Olivier Dushi, who researched the photographs 
of Zdravko Petar from the Algerian War for Independence and Nemanja Radonjic, who in the scope of his PhD researched more thoroughly the lives of both Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petar. Photos of uh, Zdravko Petar and Veda Zagorac on Tunisian-Algerian border, or uh, in this case with Franz Fanon and Patrice Lumumba, um, and uh, perhaps you have seen here, this is um, the deadly Maurice electrified and mined line that Zdravko Petar as a Yugoslav journalist and reporter had to cross on the border uh, between Algeria and Tunisia, along with Algerian fighters during the war for independence of the French colonial rule. Um, some also quotes which are very uh, illustrative of the time. Uh, as you can see, um, these are these uh, archival boxes that we found and uh, a lot of interesting information within them. For example, the, the collected editions of El Mujahid Algerian Revolutionary Paper that Veda using her position as culture attaché in Tunisia and some influence of her own pushed to be printed in Yugoslavia. And all this takes place roughly from 1958 to 1962. Now, Zdravko's writing in his uh, book, Algeria to Independence, was highly praised, uh, among others, by Basil Davidson, his contemporary, as a rare account of first-person experience, as Petro includes testimonies of, of Algerian fighters and their encounter with often cruel measures aimed by the French regime in order to discourage the guerrilla war that was in a lot of aspects uh, a reminder for Zdravko and Veda of Yugoslav partisan fighting in the Second World War. Algerian counterparts were never the distant other to them as among them they recognized that same will for liberty and independence they experienced during the war. I believe that was always the position they, they looked from at all the liberation movements in Africa, finding solidarity in that sense of being determined to fight in face of a much more powerful enemy. It is understatement to say we were astounded uh, as researchers, not as much by what Zdravko Petar and Veda Zagorac did, as we knew they were involved in anti-colonial struggle, but rather at how easily uh, all this has been forgotten, and how easily the ethnographic discourse of the museum uh, took over the content that could have been a much more appropriate way to narrate the anti-colonial struggle and anti-colonial thinking. <clears throat> However, in our attempt uh, to present all the unrecognized uh, values, we felt uh, we need to pose some important questions regarding collecting and ethnographization too. And we did not want uh, to erase or skip any of the layers um, and, uh, in the narration of this institution. Therefore, the methodology that we applied to the Nimpakor uh, Nazizi exhibition used a permanent display to create an interface. The exhibition promoted uh, the redefinition and reconceptualization of the visible or explicit museum content through the recognition and affirmation of unknown or little known content. Because the display is uh, the work of architects uh, Savit and Slobodan Masic, the exhibition used minimal visual intervention without disrupting the, the primary elements, choosing to write over the existing content. New meanings were introduced uh, by interpolating information chosen from secondary collections and archives in correlation to already existing layers of representation. This uh, writing over approach to content necessarily leads to a specific kind of historicization of the museum through the recognition of all the previous uh, significant contexts, therefore recognizing different museums within the museum. But I find especially important in understanding social and culture phenomena is uh, taking into account the current position from which we speak, our own course of thinking and uh, 
acting that we choose to take, set within the specific environment that we find ourselves in, from our own micro settings to more general local environment, from networked spaces that span across the world that are based on the recognition of common goals and values to overshadowing realities of global capitalism. Nimpa Kornadzidzi exhibition was an attempt, following a decade of theoretical and practical research, to reposition the emphasis of this institution and reconceptualize it through recognition of its less visible or invisible aspects that were in tune with the discourse of its founding, namely non-alignment and anti-colonialism. Rather than making the influence I hoped for at the museum, the idea in a way took on the life of its own. And following the invitation by Buona Pishkur from the Museum of Contemporary Art, Metelkova, Moderna Galleria Ljubljana, Emilia and I packed the image of the Museum of African Art, the Veda and Dr. Zravko Petcher collection based on our research and critical exhibition in Pakor Nadzidzi into a curatorial object or a complex exhibit. Within the exhibition Southern Constellations, the Poetics of the Non-Aligned, it was first on show at Ljubljana in 2019 and later at another exhibition, Solidarity Spores in Asia Culture Center in Guangzhou, South Korea in 2020. In reviewing what has been done so far, I also decided, informed by a decade of my work as an in-house curator, and then by another decade of reflecting upon this museum as theorist, to use the opportunity of this presentation and to leave an open proposition. It is partially inspired by the non-aligned museum uh, conference, um, the exchange with Katarina Zivanovic, Jelena Vesic, and perhaps most of all with uh, Bojana Piškor from the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Museum in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and her thinking about uh, a non-aligned contemporaneity in a museum. Namely, I propose uh, that the museum should change yet again in accordance with two most important lines of thinking and acting. One would be reactualization of the affirmative legacies that it was built in mind with in the first place. And the second one would be employing the knowledge produced so far in order to disrupt the museum as a colonial institution. And this is how I see it. I propose that museums should embrace the ideas from the time of its founding and become the anti-colonial museum. I think it should set the anti-colonial, decolonial, anti-fascist and anti-racist thinking as the main line of its research, work, exhibiting, publishing, as well as public engagement and actions. I believe it should uh, give its collections a more balanced role within its overall representation and activity, that it should abandon the ethnographic interpretation of African art collections altogether, and that it should re-engage its anti-colonial archives, that it should co establish collaboration with individuals, organizations and institutions that would not be based on the perceived importance of a particular institution, but rather on the knowledge they can contribute with. In relation to this, that it should establish long-term connections of collaboration and exchange with individuals all around the world and not talk on someone else's behalf, but rather open space for other people to share their point of view on topics that primarily concern them or they are knowledgeable about. Again, in relation to this, that it should not use other people as informants, but rather collocutors with respect for their knowledge and worldview. That it could serve as intersection of imagined past and imagined future, informing the imagination needed for envisaging the future with its emancipatory values, at the same time critically and self-reflectively approach its previous practice, which is a prerequisite for any work on the decolonization of the mind that it should not only look back or forward, but understand the urgency of the moment we have found ourselves in and link all of its production to contemporary articulation of our current state as a society, that it should have a long durée perception of the phenomena it would engage with, stitching through 
sowing through or linking through past, present and future in a responsible, conscious manner. That it should delineate the values it stands by, express them clearly and inscribe them into every segment of its work. However, I do not propose that these changes are permanent or unchangeable, as can be seen through our work in the last decade, every new step leads to logical methodological changes and outcomes. I have in mind a quote um, from Stanley Evelyn, an object uh, is a slow event. And I think that the museum is a slow event too, one in which many participate. So depending on the input that we supply, this slow event will eventually deliver certain output, obviously informed by numerous aspects that are not only our work, but the work of many. So I will end with this. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, I have a, a few questions, but of course I'll keep them at bay until uh, we have a response uh, from the audience to this uh, another wonderful talk that you gave us uh, about the concept of the museum itself and what does it mean uh, to have an institution as a Museum of African Art in Belgrade at this moment in time. So uh, I'm going to take questions. You can uh, raise hands uh, uh, from the audience if you know how to do that. There is a function in Teams. You are welcome to just speak uh, on the microphone if you like or uh, type in the chat if you are able to. Uh, so whoever wants to start us off, uh, I would be uh, happy to take a question. OK, Tina, Tina Gverovic. Hi, Anna. Hi, Tina. <laughs> I'm back again with my uh, question from this morning. Uh, so I'm really grateful that you, um, you know, that this sort of um, answers it. But I would like to hear more about um, uh, this uh, sort of approach of writing over uh, uh, and curatorial object. Uh, um, so you s sort of touched upon it, but I suppose it's crucial and vital in um, in the exhibition setup and uh, decolonial thinking and reconceptualization of the um, initial setup. So thank you, Tina. Yes, I, I would say it is. Um, now I have just to explain why it was uh, why it was necessary step also. Uh, because, as I said, this uh, permanent uh, display uh, stayed more or less the same for 44 years. And there was some kind of, um, I don't know, some kind of reluctance to just change it all at once. Uh, now, while I was um, a curator uh, uh, working for this museum in 2004, there were deliberations of making another exhibition at the time. and. Um, well, something happened with the budget and uh, some things were delayed and it never happened. But uh, I did have, um, let's say, um, first first row seat to, to these events at the time. And I, I realized what, what this next, uh, next step exhibition would be. It was very much in tune with what was happening at the time within the Musée du Cap Only or some other uh, Western type museums. Um, and actually, I, I, I think now whether it would be better if we had this kind of change in 2004, or is it better that we ha have kept this, uh, the, that we have kept this display so long? In my mind, my first, uh, let's say, intuitive reaction was that uh, we need to uh, reconsider, rethink this particular exhibition. First, why is it set up the way it is? What does it say and why did it stay for so long? So in a way, I, I was very keen on um, not really historizing the, the, the very 
um, permanent display, but it, in the meantime, for 44 years, it was creating this visual image of African art within the, let's say, local local community, but not not that local anyway. I mean, regionally. So we needed we needed some time actually to reflect upon what has been shaping this visual image for such a long time, you know, because it was r rather identified, this kind of green and blue that you also commented upon. It was something that was completely identified with the image of African African art with here, let's say, in the in this um, in this um, um, uh, surrounding. Uh, so I, I felt that we actually need to acknowledge the presence of this uh, of this representation for such a long time, and to comment upon, uh, of course, the, the the time of its uh, of its um, opening and its creation, but also on all the different changing contexts that, in the meantime, shaped it in so many different ways. You know, and so in a way, it, the 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 display stayed the same, but the the changing context writing over and writing over and writing over in so many different ways, it really was a palimpsest, if, if, if you think about it, because uh, uh, some things were so thoroughly erased and so uh, thoroughly forgotten. And uh, you, you have seen this through, the, let's say, archives. We call them archives, but they are more of, more of uh, let's say, collections within the museum. But they were not even considered a collection. They were considered archival boxes full of something which nobody knew what, what, what was, you know. So in, in a way, I felt that we need to uh, acknowledge this permanent display to explain it before we remove it, actually. And th this is where I come to my proposition now. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, professionally um, just say, just remove it. I mean, it couldn't couldn't have been my professional standpoint. Like, just let's remove it and not reflect upon it, because I felt there is so many different layers that we can actually uh, express and explore through what has already been there. Now that we have done this, this kind of overwriting, uh, and I, I'm calling it overwriting, but also sewing through and stitching through, because there is so many different, sometimes conflicting. Um, aspects of it, you know, coming through, such as these uh, animal skulls that you have seen in the work of Barthélemy Togo, which were also part of the museum collection in a way, and they they were something that is a legacy of Zdravko Petr, but so are the photographs of Zdravko Petr with Algerian fighters and uh, Franz Fanon. So we have these really conflicting images of, at, at from one point, this kind of collector's discourse when this kind of collector's passion is not uh, expressed only through African objects, but also um, trophies, you know. So th this is kind of like a, this, this very stereotypical image of a white man in Africa, you know. But on the other hand, you have so many different la layers and uh, levels of explanation of uh, Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr's engagement in the anti-colonial struggle. And on top of all this, what we were really, really surprised by was this, this um, I would call this kind of um, auto-censorship of an institution um, um, that, you know, that during the 1990s and 2000s, when it was so disconnected from the time of its opening, there was like an um, internal uh, auto-censorship and erasure of certain traits, but we have to make distinction between what is, let's say, discursively um, mm, projected uh, erasure of certain narratives. I mean, discursive as in, as in discourses of the time, of the 90s and 2000s. And what is this kind of, um, let's say, normalization th that, for example, why was Veda Zagoras forgotten while Zdravko Petr was not? So, I mean, there is so many different uh, levels and layers of also erasure, effacement and oblivion that I'm very much interested in. So, I, in a way, I didn't want to lose any of it before we may make a comment, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, Tina, is that OK? Can I go to another question? Thank you. <laughs> OK, so Anna. Athanasius, Athanasius, uh, shall I read it or do you want to um, speak a little bit about um, the archive and the document? 
do you want me to read your comment or do you want to come to the mic? Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I, I mean, I, I wasn't sure what was um, uh, easier. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just just to say that it was a fantastic presentation and um, lots of things to uh, to think about and lots of things to research further. Uh, but the question and my interest is uh, primarily in, in document in museum documentation. And I was wondering when you said that one of the priorities is to um, engage with the with the archival material and the you know the material that's already in the museum. Um, the 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 kind of um, uh, uh, documentation methods that have been used, uh, which inevitably include a sort of reduction of information and um, and um, you know the, the sort of the inevitable taxonomy, the classification of things. Do you think that these methods could be a barrier for the kind of engagement that you're thinking? Uh, yes, thank, thank you for this question. Absolutely, it, it is always there is always a meta discourse of the institution. There is always a meta discourse of a classification of an archive, etc. So it is inevitable in this case as well. What is perhaps different is that it was never really an archive or a collection in its own right until we kind of made it into an archive or a collection. I, I, I hesitate to, to, to use, I mean, it is uh, colloquially referred to as an archive, but it is not an archive. Uh, I mean, in, in a very kind of professional sense of the word. But, you know, this, uh, this is kind of accumulation of materials that were left after Veda, Zagorac and Zravko Petr, because the museum in a way inherited a lot of their stuff, uh, personal stuff, including this documentation. And uh, somehow they did not really perceive it. I mean, they sensed that it is important to, to make a record of this, but I don't think that they really realized how important this would be for this museum, because this is where we found elements to recuperate this anti-colonial discourse as at one point it was nowhere to be found within the museum and so we found it there so in these terms it is not really um, an archive that was built according to let's say archival um, uh, professional standards but it is more of a private collection uh, from Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr and in these terms it will more reflect perhaps what we will make out of it now because we are just getting acquainted with it in the last several years and when i say we i really do not belong to this museum i am collabor collaborating with uh, its curators uh, from time to time but uh, in the meantime they also took uh, uh, this project seriously and they digitized uh, almost more i think most most of the material so and i think what is also important that uh, the interests of the researchers are actually dictating how these uh, um, particular objects or documents will come together so this is I would not really say it uh, like a very, very um, inst institutional approach to archive. I would rather call it um, some kind of a personal, personal documentation that uh, actually became more and more increasingly important within this museum due to the interest shown by the researchers. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Yes. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, I have a question. Uh, let me just uh, have a look at who raised the hand because I need to change to a participant field for just a second. So Felipe, Felipe Scovino, go ahead if you can use the microphone. If not, just type and I'll, um, I'll read the question to Anna. Can you hear me, Felipe? Okay, so do you want to, if you can't use your microphone, do you want to type your question and then I'll, um, I'll be able to read it to Anna. Um, uh, Felipe might be uh, in Brazil. Okay, go ahead then. You need to switch on your microphone, uh, Felipe. So unmute yourself. At the moment, I can see you're muted. 
OK, Anna, can you see the message or shall I read it to you? Uh, uh, this is the one, um, dear Anna, thanks. Um, I would like if Petcher eventually met Franz Fanon. Mm -hmm. Is that the question? I um, so. Yes, um, um, I'm not sharing the screen anymore, but uh, uh, you could see that, uh, yes, they met uh, um, in Tunisia because uh, uh, the, uh, Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petcher were in Tunisia uh, during the war for independence of Algeria. And there was this modest line that Zdravko Petcher would cross. It was mined and electrified line that he would cross and he would go to Algeria and uh, as a reporter, as a journalist on the side of the Algerian freedom fighters. So when he was back in Tunisia, um, he was also um, engaged in conversation and uh, uh, let's say social life of, of Algerian fighters who were also uh, crossing crossing the border to to Tunisia and uh, among other thing among other other events there was one event where where that photograph that you have seen perhaps uh, of uh, of Zdravko Petr with Omar Usedik and the Franz Fanon. Um, I would not say that they were like a close acquaintances, but uh, they definitely uh, had the same circle of uh, of uh, people. They they knew in Tunisia at the time. Thank you, Anna. You're welcome. OK, do we have any more questions from the audience? Um, and, and Anna, I don't know how tired you are considering you had two. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm going to um, ask you to try to do what we have done uh, uh, in the morning. Uh, so um, people can maybe gather m more questions or I can continue the interrogation. Yes, uh, I will be taking you around the museum. Yes. And uh, perhaps this time a bit slower because you said it was a little bit nauseous last time. Yes, but I think it's because you're moving. Um, uh, the uh, you are moving and we are uh, sitting down anyway. Okay, uh, okay. Don't worry about it, but just talk and walk. So well, um, now I, I I would appreciate if there is another question so I can answer, but. Uh, uh, okay. Altogether, you know, you you have you have heard my proposition for this museum and how it should change. And now, no matter how much I actually like this uh, this permanent display, because it formed my, let's say, it influenced my visual register and how I perceive African art. I nevertheless would still say that uh, it is rather confined within the limits of ethnographic representation. So. Um, well, perhaps we, we, we can we can uh, think about um, part of it being kept um, as a, as a sort of an example. But uh, anyway, I, I think this is not this is not really. I mean, I, c I can be a little bit nostalgic about it, but I still would not say that this is that this is the right uh, way to represent it. And you have seen those, let's say, uh, colonial and anti-colonial uh, traits that I distinguished within this uh, uh, the, within this uh, permanent display. And actually, I would say, you know, when you are stereotypical. Stereotypical, <laughs> that this is a difficult one. When you're using stereotypical representation, I think um, it definitely is bringing this kind of uh, meta discourse of ethnographic representation. And no matter how anti colonial you are in your thinking and uh, um, um, you know, attempts at decolonizing uh, the world. If you do not decolonize the visual and semantic register, it really cannot be done. So I, I would say I am a little bit um, uh, emotional about, about this um, um, permanent display. And I would say that um, in a way I like it. And I said during the last uh, uh, during the last presentation that I found out something new about uh, why this blue and the green were used. And uh, I can I can repeat the story if you like. I don't know. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Well, it, it is a funny story because, you know, when uh, unfortunately uh, Slobodan Mašić is not uh, alive anymore and uh, I, I did have an opportunity to talk uh, to him um, some 10 or more years ago and he said that nobody ever deciphered really what this um, uh, this permanent display is about, you know. And then when I researched a little bit more for these two presentations today, I realized that um, because um, the very, very exhibition was done in a haste and it was done uh, within two weeks in May uh, to be opened on 23rd of May in 1977. And um, at the same time, in May 1977, one of the of the one among last uh, African countries to be actually liberated and to gain independence was Djibouti, and uh, it is interesting that this um, this I, I mean this this is also almost a fictional narrative that I'm talking about, but I'm allowing myself this. Uh, let's say, <laughs> liberty to, to, to be a bit fictional about it, because Mašić was this kind of character as well. And um, there are only four elements that he used in representation, and four elements are blue and uh, green, as you have seen. And there is this uh, triangular base that every single plinth or post has a triangular base. And there is one more element that now I am searching for, but I cannot really find. Um, there was another element, and that was a red star uh, that he used uh, on maps to show where a certain object is from, which country. So mm -hmm. there were just four elements, blue, green, a triangle, and a red star. And uh, on the flag of Djibouti, we are finding exactly these four elements. So I would say that because uh, anti-colonial thinking was... Um, so much present within this institution. Now I, I'm, I'm approaching this map that perhaps you can see the red star. Can you see it? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so that it, I, I really find it uh, improbable, if not impossible, that uh, Slobodan Mašić didn't didn't know about the flag of Djibouti at the time. So th this is actually my deliberation of it. It can be perhaps fictional or poetic, but this is how I, I like to interpret it at the moment. But nevertheless, as I said, I think that this museum really needs to change because we cannot, really, we cannot perpetuate the same ethnographic uh, uh, representation anymore. I mean, it is rather toxic. To, to be honest, even when such an institution as this museum is in question. And I think this is something that we just need to let go. Mm. So, okay, are, are, you, are you ready to see me again? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Did, you, did you have enough of the museum? Uh, yes, but I would like to ask you about the space of the, of the museum. So if you kind of... Um, Talk to us a little bit about uh, the area where museum is situated, because that is kind of quite important. And then um, how that plays a part in in how it's uh, uh, represented, considered, understood. Um, the proximity to the Museum of uh, Yugoslavia as well is also uh, quite interesting. And you were saying that both institutions. Um, uh, th this morning maybe are not utilized as a kind of interesting site uh, for uh, uh, the colonial discourse or not used enough maybe um, uh, in the sense that we talk about uh, decolonialization at least uh, here in the West. So I don't know how much uh, those sites are known or what what uh, what is going on uh, uh, over there in relation to that? So if you can talk I to see. us, yes, hey. yes. Well, uh, uh, concerning um, decolonization of institutions, I really don't think that is something that even crosses uh, mind. Uh, of, well, I, I I don't want I don't want of course to generalize, but it is definitely I mean the last thing that I heard about decolonizing decolonizing an institution and it is not as if people were not interested into this topic. I was asked last year I think uh, in May to um, to give a comment on um, the return of objects from Western museums to African countries and. Uh, 
So it is not as if there is no interest in this topic, but I would say that um, most people here would say actually that it has nothing to do with us. And uh, actually my colleague Emilia Ashton is writing a paper on how we can deliberate on um, this kind of uh, uh, possibility of returning some things uh, in a museum that, that was based around friendship uh, and anti-colonial thinking and that allegedly has all the papers necessary uh, to prove that all the objects were taken out of uh, the countries of origin with permission. Now, you know, in my in my PhD, I was writing about this that um, in some way uh, this museum does not even get near this category of Western type museum that it strived to reach because these objects are mostly different objects from those that Western museums have. And, and even though the collectors wanted to make a representative collection of African art in, in collector's terms, um, in my mind, its most important significance is within the context it was created in. Um, and when it comes to those two collections uh, at the Museum of Yugoslavia, they, they of course have different objects from African countries. That do, those are objects that were received as gifts. For example, within this museum, Museum of, uh, of African Art, these uh, objects were considered like um, second rate because they were kind of too contemporary or too tourist art or too... Um, um, uh, uh, con well, contemporary mo most of all, because um, now this is perhaps too a long story, too long a story to to tell about uh, the whole uh, the whole system that was actually created to to um, um, evaluate what an Af a valuable quote unquote African object is. So th this is a really, really, really. Um, difficult and uh, important story, but I will not tell it here. I will just say that these objects do not really fulfill uh, the request uh, needed for an object to be categorized as such as, as uh, uh, let's say, um, very important or significant object within African, African art field as it was created by collectors and museums in the West. However, I would say that both collections, this one and at the Museum of Yugoslavia, are uh, interesting in their own way and they're actually inseparable from the context that, that made them. So I do not advocate that these collections should, should be completely <laughs> taken off and never, never shown again. I just imply that this museum should not be about ethnological approaches to African arts or uh, any kind, any kind of uh, um, uh, ethnological or ethnographic display, but instead it should deal with topics that concern us now and that can actually be found inscribed within uh, the very, very origins of this institution. Okay, and the space? Yes, yes, you said the space. So that, that is interesting that uh, actually this building, I said that it is one of the three buildings that were, that were built in the 60s and the 70s uh, in Belgrade to host a collection. However, this was not the first building on this, on this site as the building that we are now in, I am in, um, actually was built around the already existing studio of Moshe Piade, uh, a famous uh, artist. And uh, there was this, this smaller building that was incorporated within this new new building of the Museum of African Art, and we actually now. Oh, let, let me take you there. Perhaps we can we can do that. I will just take you to the temporary uh, temporary exhibitions or thematic exhibitions. Um, a place space, and that was uh, the studio of Moshe Piade. Right. Now, th this is how the night in the museum looks like. So, wow. <laughs> and this is this is actually the temporary exhibition. And th these are the remnants of the space that was Moshe Piada's studio. This is a fireplace and the staircase. Mm. So, so this this is actually the the building that was first on this on this spot. And what's interesting is that um, the museum is within 
a residential area of Belgrade, which is actually one where all the embassies and, uh, well, let's say posh buildings in Belgrade are. So, um, I mean, there was this kind of, um, let's say, diplomatic or a political um, view of this um, of this museum being at su such an, um, let's say, lovely spot. Mm. And um, I wouldn't really, uh, I wouldn't really say that um, that was that was planned. I think I think it was a matter of uh, circumstances. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, we have uh, a few minutes left. Uh, are there any burning questions uh, from uh, anybody in the audience? I'm just going to check in case I missed something or someone. No. OK, well, um, it was absolute pleasure to uh, have you, Anna, uh, with us for the whole day today. Uh, I hope you're not uh, too exhausted and you're going to have a lovely dinner um, and, uh, and rest uh, after giving us such a wonderful uh, tour. Um, it was also amazing to hear you speak about uh, the little known uh, museum that is actually incredibly important um, for uh, our understanding of um, decolonization uh, in the uh, uh, European context that takes on um, Eastern European experience as well, but we seem not to necessarily take it into account, uh, at least uh, from here uh, in the UK. Uh, I congratulate you for the whole work that you have been doing uh, un until now, uh, because it has been amazing and uh, it is really kind of um, uh, prompting, us, prompting us all uh, to know more, to learn more, to research more and to kind of uh, work with museums in uh, a critical kind of uh, manner. So thank you so much uh, for being. Thank you, thank you for the invitation, and I would like to thank everyone who who joined us this evening. It was a real pleasure to to share all of this with you.